A big city lawyer went duck hunting in a rural area. He shot and dropped a duck, but it fell on a farmer's field on the other side of the farmer's fence. As the lawyer climbed over the fence, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked what he was doing. And the lawyer said, I shot a duck and it fell into this field, and now I'm going to retrieve it. The litter, the litter gator, well, the farmer said, this is my property, and you're not coming over here. The litigator, the indignant lawyer, said, I'm one of the best trial attorneys in this city, and if you don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. So the old farmer smiled, and he said, apparently, you don't know how we settle disputes in the countryside. We settle small disagreements like this with the three-kick rule. And the lawyer asked, what's the three-kick rule? And the farmer replied, well, because the dispute occurs on my land, I kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and so on back and forth until someone gives up. The attorney quickly thought about the proposed contest and decided he could easily take the old codger. He agreed to abide by the local custom. So the old farmer slowly climbed down off his tractor, walked up to the attorney. His first kick planted the steel-toed boot right in the attorney's groin, dropped him to his knees. The second kick to the midriff, he bent over on all fours and he was throwing up in a field. And the third kick, he kicked him in the rear end and sent him face into a fresh cow pile. So the lawyer summed every bit of his will and managed to get to his feet, wiped his face with the arm of his jacket, and said, okay, you old coot, now it's my turn. And the old farmer smiled and said, nah, I give up, you can have the duck. <laughs> True story, no doubt. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're talking about stress today. Stress and similar things. Stress can be defined as as any type of change that causes physical, emotional, or psychological strain. Stress is your body's response to anything that requires attention or action. The Mayo Clinic describes stress, uh, the symptoms that may be affecting to your health, even though you might not know it. You may blame sickness for that annoying headache, your sleeping troubles, feeling unwell, or your lack of focus at work, but stress may really be the cause. Stress symptoms uh, can affect your body, your thoughts, your feelings, and your behavior. Knowing common stress symptoms can help you manage them, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, obesity, and diabetes. We all get weary and burdened at one time or another. Has so anybody in here never got weary or burdened? I don't see any hands up. <laughs> no, our bodies wear out. The older we get, the tireder we get. We used to be, what used to be easy is now hard. What used to be hard is now impossible, or nearly so. We have to accept that we can't do what we used to do. It, it takes longer, and we need help. Our strength wanes. One thing we have going for us as we get older is wisdom. We have learned a lot from life's experiences. Wisdom is, uh, human wisdom that is, is knowledge tempered by experience. 
when you came out of college, or when you come out of college with a lot of knowledge, you have a degree, but you don't know anything. You know facts, but you don't have wisdom. It takes experience to gain wisdom and learn how to use those facts. Stress is another kind of being weary. Emotionally weary. Stress is worrying. We start worrying when we were children. I remember worrying about being caught. <laughs> My parents thought I was a delightful and well-behaved little boy. <laughs> I got news for you. I always worried about being caught. So I became very crafty or sneaky. I wasn't doing real bad things, at least by today's standards. <sighs> there was a girl that lived right across the alley. Her name was Candy. And she was standing right in front of me. We we're down in the basement, um, other kids and her and I. And I had a pair of pliers in my hand. What else could I do? I pinched her in her rear. I mean, what else could I do? She was standing right in front of me. I had the pliers. <laughs> I was probably about nine years old at the time. Her parents had mad faces when they came over. My brother ran across her a couple months ago in Dubois. She's still there. And I talked to her on the phone, and, and uh, my sister talked. We're, we're all close friends. We're little kids. Even after I did that, she was still, she got over it. But... I got caught that time. Couldn't get away with that one. But to worry about being caught caused me to be obedient most of the time. I started smoking a pipe when I was 12 years old. They never knew that I had a pipe and tobacco until I graduated from high school. I lit a cigar in a car on the way home. I thought, I can't live this lie for the rest of my life. And I didn't quit smoking a pipe till I was 23 and got saved. 23, 25, 20, somewhere in that neighborhood. That kind of worry can be a good thing, you know. But worry, but worry about what's coming at you results in stress. And stress is harmful to you. We get stressed about our finances. There's too much month left at the end of your money. When you can't pay the bills, you're stressed. If you can't pay the taxes, you're stressed. We get stressed about what our kids are going through. Raising teenagers is very stressful. Have you been there? You don't know what's coming next. You wonder where they are, who they're hanging out with, what they're doing. It's just stressful. Somehow, somehow we get through it. Thank the Lord that our sons are all good, decent men. But they weren't always so. <laughs> they were teenagers, you know. We, we got through that. Now they're, one's 52, one's 50, and the other one's almost 50. They're, you know, they're decent men. We get stressed when health problems come along. We get stressed about the doc, what the doctor's going to find. We get stressed about the te what the tests are going to show. I have to go for one battery of tests for my regular doctor because he's trying to you know, treat my diabetes. That's a new thing for me. And I've got to get a, a battery of tests for the surgeon because I'm going to have this surgery done. And we get stressed when the government takes money away from us and uses to pay for things that we would not approve of. We get stressed when the country that we love embraces things that are ungodly. Talking about abortion, United States, this was uh, day before yesterday, there were 2,446 abortions in one day. Since 73, 65,702, 65 million, 702,000, and 802. By Planned Parenthood since 1970, 10 million, 315,000. 
by Planned Parenthood this year is 107,634. United States this year, 238,000. Uh, and after, in the U.S. this year, after 16 weeks gestation, 11,426,000 11, abortions. Talking about our culture coddling gays, even in the churches, gay bishops, gay pastors, gay people in high office, you see them constantly. But the Bible describes it as an abomination. And the newest wrinkle is this gender business. In the schools, some of the places they want to do this without parent approval to give these blo blockers to keep kids from going through puberty. And those are dangerous chemicals. Sweden, a very progressive country, has outlawed the gender treatments for children. 20 of our states have outlawed that as well. 30 more to go. The fact that they're doing it anywhere is stressful to Christians. God doesn't make mistakes. He made them male and female. If an adult wants to mutilate themselves, that's their business, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> we fret about the border situation, the invasion at the border. How can we absorb all those people? 10 million people, how can we absorb them all? They put a strain on our schools, on our hospitals, social services, and we don't know what they're up to. Some of those people are escaping tyranny. And we don't mind that, but 10 million. But they're still human beings. And I wanna see them get saved. Get saved and take the gospel back to where they came from. That's what I wanna see. I wanna see revival in those immigrants. And I wanna see them get saved and take the gospel back home and start a worldwide revival. That's not impossible. Another cause of stress is the rise of Marxism in our country. We fought wars. People died to prevent that. Marxism hates God, hates religion, hates the nuclear family, and they hate private property, all of which God approves. So they hate God. Marxism, socialism, communism, all those isms are evil. So we have a lot of things to stress us. But we also have a God in heaven who loves us and cares for us. Psalm 73, 21 to 24, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, it starts that way in verse 21. The psalmist here is grieved and embittered because of what was going on in the culture around him, just like we are. Verse 22, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. He's confessing that his stress was an embitterment was a wrong reaction. Verse 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. And here the psalmist realizes that there was no need for his trepidation because he has the presence of God with him all the time. You guide me, verse 24, with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. There was no need for him to be stressed. The godly will win. <laughs> Back to the text, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. First of all, we are bid invited that is to come directly to god come to me not through a mediator not through a priest not through mary not through a saint jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except through me we don't need a mediator you're invited god wants you to come to him 
Then it says, you who are weary. Just as carrying a physical load makes you tired, I get tired from very little effort. We look back to see what we could do when we were young. We can't quite do that. At least I can't quite do that, do that anymore. If I carry something up or down the steps a couple of times, like a laundry basket, I'm huffing and puffing. I get achy feeling right across here. I went to the doctor. He said, there's no blockages, nothing wrong with your heart. You're okay. It's just probably something. I have uh, scar tissue in my lungs and stuff like that, but... When we were in business, I often worked 12 to 16 hours a day. Believe me, I was weary. But sometimes, no matter how hard we work, we just couldn't get the work done when we promised it. That made me really stressed to promise and not be able to accomplish it. So what makes you weary? Things your kids and grandkids are going through, they cause stress for you. Or there's stresses in your family dynamics. A lot of families have stresses in the family. God knows all about every kind of weariness, every stress you are going through. He knows what frightens us. He knows what bears down on us. You ever feel pressure like bearing down on you? got to get out of this situation he knows Jesus was fully God and fully man he knows he knows weary he was so weary from people pressing in on him that he got in a boat and preached from the boat they were on the shoreline and then it says you who are burdened a burden is something that you're carrying Something that you're loaded down with, that's a burden. Some of us carry one burden after another. We put one load down and pick up another one. Some carry a particular burden for a long time. Someone insulted you. Some people get hurt by a church and they carry that hurt as a burden. Jesus was burdened with a task. He knew that he would be the ultimate sacrifice. He knew that he would offer himself on the, uh, to the Father, that his blood shed on the cross would pay the penalty for my sins and for yours. His burden was to take, him, take on to himself all the sins of mankind and to redeem all those who would receive him. That was the ultimate burden. Jesus was the ultimate burden bearer, the ultimate burden carrier. Then it says, I will give you rest. Can you imagine rest like that? Not a rest from a place to sit, not a rest from a cup of cold water, not a rest in a recliner, not a rest from a nap, but God himself will give you rest, a relief from the, your burdens. He wants to give you a relief from your stress. He wants to give you peace. No matter what's pressing on you, no matter how far you seem to be from rest, no matter how long you've been burdened, he promises to give you rest. In your, if your weariness comes from an unrepented sin, rest comes in the form of his forgiveness. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find a rest for your souls. Being yoked with Jesus means that he carries most of the load. Our burden with Jesus is to carry the gospel. He has all the strength. We just have to pull the load or the burden with him 
to be yoked with him. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know about you, but I'm all about easy. <laughs> His burden is light because he has done the work. He has done that part of it. God knows what our burdens are. He knows when the burden is from the cares of this life. He knows when, when, uh, when we carry a burden of guilt, you ever been there? He knows when we have been offended or when we have been the offender. Rest and peace are available when we come to him. Philippians 4, 4 to 8, rejoice in the Lord always. I say, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Do not be anxious. In other words, don't worry. Don't fret. I think that some people like fretting. <laughs> but stress is harmful to the people that are fretting, to the people who are stressed. In Italian, it's... It's a non pensare. That means don't worry about it. <laughs> non pensare. In every situation, verse 6, no matter how annoying, no matter how stressful, no matter how impossible, every situation, everyone, we shouldn't think that we are to give only certain situations to God. He wants to bless everything we do. He's interested in the small things. And then it says, with thanksgiving, have a grateful heart. God saved you. He has made a way for you to be free from the law of sin and death. God knows. everything you're going through and he will keep his promises sometimes he does it in a way we don't expect we respect god's sovereignty he knows best he does it when he's going to do it and he does it how he's going to do it we can't push god around and say i want you to do it this way we've tried that <laughs> that doesn't work if you just let god take care of it here's my problem lord I give it to you, and he'll take care of it, sometimes in amazing ways. Verse 7, he will give you peace. The world's peace is transitory. It doesn't last. God's peace transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense to the mortal mind. How we can have beautiful peace in the midst of turmoil. The world's people all around us can't believe how we can be at peace in the midst of terrible situations. That's a testimony. It's, a, it's an opening to declare the goodness of God. If they say, how can you be so peaceful when all this is going on in your life? Well, that's how good God is. It's an opportunity, it's an open door. And that peace, God's peace, is there to guard our heart. Guard against the enticements of this fallen world. The world is not a friendly place to believers. James 4, for you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? 
Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. If I think the world system is going to be better than God for me, then I would be on the wrong side of God. So let's put our trust completely in God. If you're going through physical problems, trust God to heal. That's what we did this morning. Keep it up. But respect his sovereignty. God uses medical science to heal. He also heals directly. When I was 14 years old, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. It's incurable. Nobody gets over it. My brother-in-law has been crippled with that since, since he married my sister. He's had most of his joints replaced and a lot of them are a second time. And he, he's crippled. Rheumatoid arthritis. I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. I, I went to school on crutches sometimes. Rheumatoid run, jumps around on different joints. My knees used to swell up so the patella was floating and, and they would turn red and I have heat coming out of them. They would be so inflamed. And by the time I was 20, I had the last flare-up ever of rheumatoid arthritis and it never came back. And I wasn't a believer then. So I like to say I was healed on credit. <laughs> I don't have it. Medical science can't fix it. God fixed it. I even had it in my jaws. Everywhere, every joint I had it in. So God does heal directly. Remember, we, I remember a lady in church down there at my home church, and there were some women around her praying. During a service, this church had 200 people in it, and and pastor stopped stopped the service and looked at them like, what you know, what are you doing back there? It was like a disturbance, and Jane Grove was in the middle of all that, and she said she needs prayer. And this lady had a tumor in her throat, and she coughed it up and spit it out, and that was the end of it, of the tumor that was in her throat. When those ladies got around, God does heal directly. He does. But if you get healed, God heals you, whether it's through medical science or not. James 1, 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So what about you today? Are you stressed? What stresses you? Give it to God and leave it there. That's all I got to say. If you come to God and lay your burdens down before him, don't pick them up again when you leave. Lay your burdens down and go away figuring God's going to take care of this. When he wants and how he wants. Amen? But he will. Would you stand? We prayed for people's needs today. Um, I hope we never forget to be doing that. We always should do that. Because this is when God's people are all gathered together. And that's a good thing to do. If there's anybody in the house today that's just really stressed about a situation, come on down. I don't, we'll pray for you again. If anybody undergoing a certain amount of stress, it's a hard thing, hard things in your life, just come down. If not, we'll pray a dismissal and you can get to the restaurant. <laughs> Father God, we thank you that we're in a company of powerful believers in this house today, Lord. Powerful believers. We have powerfully believe because we have a powerful God. Because you are God and there is no other. And we can't hang any of our stresses on anybody else and believe that they will be taken care of. You are God and there is no other. So we honor you with our very lives today, Lord. And help us to remember that if we get stressed about something, just to give it to you. Just to turn it over to you. And you will take care of it. So we thank you, Lord, for the 
for the believers in the house today. And uh, we just ask that you grant travelers mercies and keep us all safely until we come back next time. In Jesus' name, amen. Next time is uh, 6 o'clock on Wednesday.